Hello and welcome to The Thriller Zone. I'm your host, David Temple. Thank you, thank you, thank you for making us one of the fastest growing podcasts in America. I can't do it without you. I'm just being straight up. Uh, by the way, thank you to the folks who finally subscribed, pushed us over that 100 uh, pr- uh, subscriber mark, and we're now YouTube.com, The Thriller Zone. I should have a choir sing that. It would be so much fun, wouldn't it? <laughs> it's the little things in life. On today's show, I've got a guest that I'm trying to remember. He reached out to me some time ago and got on my books early. And I picked up this book. I got to admit, uh, it's been sitting on my shelf for a while, but I picked it up on a recent trip. And as you'll hear in the show, I read half of it on the way east and half of it on the way west. The book is The Devil Himself. The artist is Peter Ferris. This is a really, really good book. It's not his very first one, so he's not exactly our Discovering New Artist series, but he's also, you know, he doesn't have 30 under his belt. But I got a really good feeling that Peter is going to be one of those guys we're going to be hearing about for a long time to come. This was a fun interview. I had a blast. We had a little tech issues, but uh, it's cool. Also, two things. One, a surprise uh, guest makes it to the show. I'm not going to tell you any more than that. And number two, I launch a new feature in the show that, at least for right now, I'm calling, if this scene, what what am I calling it? Yeah, if this scene could talk. (laughs) So I basically take an excerpt from the book, turn it into a little piece of an audio book, and one of my favorite scenes, and let it roll. And I think Peter liked it. So, without any further ado, let's speak with Peter Ferris right here on The Thriller Zone. Oh! David Temple, how are you, man? Peter Ferris, I'm good. How are you, sir? I'm good, man. I hope my little setup is going to be adequate for you here. (laughs) I'm in my basement lair, so. It's all good. Hey, listen, I've seen a lot worse. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. know. I don't know if I've shared with you, and I won't mention any names, but it's been anywhere from, uh, I, I would have sworn they were in a cave, to I don't know that she knew where the camera was. Yeah. <laughs> You're good? You can hear me? Everything's gravy? Yeah, you sound great from my end, so hopefully... Uh, we don't have any Zoom issues here. My wife's on working upstairs and is always on Zoom. And so we'll see how this goes. I have a little, I think I told you about this. And I realized after I sent you the email, um, I try to be, my wife is always getting on me. She goes, honey, can you just use that three sentence rule? Um, <laughs> because a lot of people don't have the patience to listen to you babble on. Uh, and actually she does not have an accent like that. It's just that when I get on the phone with people from the South, I'll automatically kick into it. So you just have to roll with me. Yeah. Mine, mine, uh, waivers depends on how many, how many beers I might've had. Uh, I start to get a little syrupy. So, so two things. One is I'm launching a new feature. I think I told you about, that's what I was babbling about. Um, that I've taken a piece of, I've, I've taken a scene out of your book that I really like. You know, there are so many good ones, but that particular scene, it just kind of gave me a, a flavor of a particular emotion. So I recorded it as an audio book and it's going to be called, what am I calling it? If this scene could talk. Oh, cool. I love it. <laughs> so now it is five minutes. So if that's going to bore you, I can skip over it and we can keep going. But no, I'm all in. I'm all in, man. Whatever you want to do, I'm all about I, it. I'm doing this for you. And uh, anyway, I want to I want to save all my juice and just get to it. So I'm going to start right here with a great big welcome to the Thriller Zone, Peter Ferris. Great to be here, man. Thank you, David, for having me. I'm going to assume that A is for Atlanta. It is the Atlanta Braves. Yeah, okay, that's not an, not an Alabama hat. So yeah. Um, I, yeah, I only I had have a 50 50 chance. <laughs> yeah, I only own camouflage hats of the baseball cap varieties. So. All right, 
One of my side note before we get started on uh, the devil himself, which is this book right here, folks, which I'm going to flip around to a couple of times and start talking about it. And you're going to have the have fun with me here. I watched, <laughs> I was stalking you on Instagram and I saw you put a turkey call in your mouth and do a turkey call, right? <laughs> yeah, I was in my backyard. <laughs> Dude, I, all right. I am from the South, but I have not done a lot of hunting, which is probably people are going to look at me. Well, then you're not really from the South, boy. Uh, but, no, but I hear you. I hear you. I had not heard. I had not actually seen that done. And <laughs> do you have it nearby any chance? Because this would just crack me up. Oh, man. You know, I have some brand new calls. I, I'd have to go get them. Can I? Uh, can uh, I please, please wait. Time? It'll be worth it. <laughs> All right, I'm going right to. Yeah. Damn, folks, you're going to love this because this guy, I would have sworn there was a turkey in the audience. By the way, this is Writer's Block Coffee. I'm sipping just a little plug here. Well, okay. I haven't I haven't opened these yet. I've, I regrettably have not been able to go turkey hunting as much as I wanted to this month. We're in prime turkey season right now in Georgia, but I've just been busy. We have a six-year-old, and I just haven't been able to get to the woods, and I am absolutely pedestrian compared to if you're ever bored david which i don't think you are but go on youtube and watch uh turkey calling competitions like at the N national wildlife turkey federation at their big annual convention uh there's competitions throughout the country these guys are unreal i am garbage compared to some of these guys and gals who call turkeys like it's it's unbelievable so uh but I i'm good enough to kill a turkey let's put it that way well so. And and you're good, and you kill it. You're going to eat it. You're not just doing this for sport. No, no, no. I'm all about cooking wild game. I love making. I'll do like Chick Fil A style turkey nuggets. I've grilled them. I've smoked them. I've done just about everything with turkey breasts and legs. So, um, oh. what, do you, what do you want me to do? Let like just fire up a, a call real quick. Yeah, just you know, you can you can step back just a little bit because it's probably going to be pretty good good yeah, volume. My, but my my wife might be on a call for work. If she starts hearing like wild animals in the basement, she's going to kill me later. <laughs> That's okay. I don't get to go on the thriller zone every day. So uh, let me see. There's a brand new call. I haven't warmed up with it yet. Uh, let me see if I can do like, just like your typical uh, cluck, for example. Yeah. A make, so. it's, it's brand new. It's tough. I got to figure out placement. I'll try a okay. yelp now too, which All is right. what both, both male and females, but females typically uh, yelp for a variety of reasons. So not bad with a brand new call that I've never messed with. They they all have different cuts and you can get into the granular detail on how these things are made and people obsess over them. I'm very much an ignorant like caveman turkey hunter, you know. <laughs> all right. First of all, golf clap because I put you on the spot and you pulled through. So thank you. Hey, is that the first rider you've had making uh, animal calls on your show? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, my, my, my work here is done. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I am all about uh, breaking down that fourth wall in whatever way that I can. Yeah, I don't take myself seriously. If you have, we haven't established that now, then we never will. So uh, It's nuts because I've had people uh, go out for coffee during the show, Chris Hotty. I've had people go to get pick up uh, books that they were using for props, uh, Omakatsu. But you are the first turkey caller on the show. All right, cool. Well, uh, I, I wish I could pick up my desktop and show you all the taxidermy in the other room, but we'll save that for maybe my next visit, I hope. Oh, <laughs> my future. goodness. All right, we're going to get to the devil himself. But, you know, first, I want to I want to dig into the psyche of Peter Ferris because here's why. I kind of pride myself on research, because I think if you don't have a pretty good idea where you're going, uh, you, if you don't have a good map in your hand, you, you got no idea where you're going, probably. But there is very little personal stuff about you on the web. Like there's no, even on your website, there's no, oh, I do this in my spirit. And I happen to know you're a hunter, etc., because I follow you on Instagram, but I don't know a lot of the other stuff. So give me a little, give my listeners a little taste of you know, what you do in a real job or, or if this is the real job or are you doing your spare time, that kind of a thing? Yeah. I mean, right now I'm basically in limbo. I worked in uh, sales and syndication for a, a movie studio for a time. 
uh, here in Atlanta. And then I, I worked in film production for a bit. I actually produced an uh, independent film here in Atlanta that uh, we shot. It was based on a, a short story and screenplay by my father, actually. Um, and I did that for a few years and saw that film to completion. We sold it to a small distributor, but it was a tiny movie, independent budget. Um, and I've been in limbo kind of with COVID um, and my some success in France, where like I'm right now between careers, a house husband. My wife is what you call an adult. She has a fantastic <laughs> career. And so we're making it work right now while I kind of figure out what the hell to do with myself. That being said, I have been real busy. Um, you know, we have a six year old at home. So being a house husband in a camouflage apron suits me well. Um, <laughs> but uh, I've, I've been working with a fantastic filmmaker over the past six months to a year, not only on a devil himself film, film adaptation, but a uh, TV series project that we have right now. We have representation. It's at a major studio. Uh, it's uh, in motion. They're looking. They're looking to pair it with a showrunner right now to steward it to film. So I'm waiting to see if something breaks, and if not, then I'm just going to get a job and walk away from all this shit. <laughs> so, but um, there's just like some lines in the water, and I want to see if I get a bite. And right now, I'm just sort of stuck in limbo and like middle age. Like, what do I do? What? What, what door is going to open or close next. So that's kind of where I'm at, but you know. Okay. Well, first of all, the fact that you have any kind of momentum or whatsoever uh, on uh, a film is uh, my hat off to you. Kudos because it is not easy. I have one under my belt and it took years and years to do it, but good for you. Secondly, if this is any example, if the devil of himself is any example of what you have in store, uh, I would say, please do not quit. <laughs> I, uh, I'll try. You know, I have a book coming out in France next year and I'll be heading over there to um, promote it. Uh, I've been over there several times now on book tours and um, had a found, got lucky and found an audience over there. And it's just a night and day difference between the United States and France. So how does someone have success, a bigger success, if this is true, in France first before here, especially something in the world of Southern Noir? I mean, how does that happen? Um, you know, they if you talk to publishing professionals in France, they have their concerns and there's a lot of doom and gloom too, but for by and large, first and foremost, they love books. It's in their DNA. They, it's part of their culture. Um, they celebrate writers. They being a bookseller is a noble profession in France. And uh, without commenting on uh, politics, government regulations, et cetera, um, booksellers, independent booksellers are allowed to, um, sell books at the same discount as a, as a gigantic behemoth bookseller. So Amazon or a Costco or equivalent over there cannot undercut discount wise, you know, what an independent bookseller uh, can do on a book. So people are happy to buy books at bookstores, you know, which is obviously not the case in, in America. Right. So publishers can thrive and they, they love crime fiction. They love crime and mystery fiction over there. And, I mean, they have festivals just to celebrate that genre and a hundred thousand people show up over the course of a weekend, you know, it's unheard of. Right. Um, so there, I'm, I am, there are a ton of, you could do an entire week of shows talking to guys in, and gals in my position who have found an audience, thankfully with some luck and a good publisher in France and can't get arrested in the United States you know, or, you know, anywhere else for that matter. And that was kind of what happened to me. And, um, I, at this point, I'm so dead inside and cynical. That I, I, I just am happy for any opportunity for my work to, you know, find find a, a release somewhere in the world so oh my god let's go back to the hundred thousand people showing up on a week and celebrating uh a, an author you you, you you'd be lucky to get one thing well okay hold on a second because la uh la book fair yeah. just happened this past weekend and they probably had uh, a skadoodle of people there but um, man, I love that. And I have heard like, for instance, uh, when I was investigating the film that I did and we were talking about different markets, Germany, for instance, loves uh, crime and horror um, more so than a lot of other audiences. So that's, that's a fascinating thing to me. Is your frustration in the fact that, uh, not to put words in your mouth, that things aren't happening fast enough for you? 
Is that a little bit of it? Well, yeah, I mean, riders can definitely run into that um, and they, you know, get anxious. You want, we're all sort of, you know, you do, a, you might be super ambitious, but I think on a baseline level, you know, you do aspire to have your work released by some third party. You know, there's validation in that. You do hope for recognition. You don't want to become consumed by it, of course, but um, in this country, you know, my first novel was published by a major publisher. Um, it seems to have a little bit of a cult following and that's cool, um, but it wasn't published well and it just disappeared off the face of the earth. Um, every writer's story is different. I'll give you mine, but uh, based on the strength of the devil himself, though, I signed with an agent um, at a big agency in New York and he shopped the book around for a little bit in 2013. Uh, five or six publishers passed and then it basically got shelved and then the book just kind of languished for the next six or seven years. Um, but this fantastic publisher in France uh, saw, read the book, loved it, bought it and my first novel, Last Call for the Living, and published those in subsequent order. And the book was just, um, thanks to their efforts, just really well received. And I was able to go over there and do two book tours. I had a third canceled because of COVID. And, and the old fashioned way, like publishing in the United States, maybe in the 60s and 70s, my father was a writer. And, you know, that was what he was used to going back to the 1950s, even. Publishers invested in an author, even if they were mid-list, and built an audience book by book. And you had three or four shots to help, you know, maybe build a readership. Now, forget it. You, you got one shot at the plate. And if you don't hit a home run, like, good luck. <laughs> I mean, that's the reality, fortunately. Wow, that's a little daunting and a slightly, a more than slightly depressing. Uh, it could uh, take the wind out of a lot of people's sails. But I, you know, it's so funny. I'm, I was out at the uh, San Diego Library last night uh, watching Don Winslow on stage talk about his um, latest book, City on Fire. Mm -hmm. And he's had a prolific career and he started in those early days. And he said it wasn't until about his sixth or seventh book before he got real recognition. And I think perhaps right about that time was Savages, which Oliver Stone picked up and turned into a film. But it made me think when you have a talent that ginormous and you can't get uh, particular traction or heat on your side uh, in record time, then the odds are thin. And then now to your point, I'm watching people today and they're saying, you know, there are so many of my friends who go, oh, you know, I really thought I'd get an agent that could just kick back and like chill. And I'm like, dude, no, you're insane because you have to work twice as hard now because A, they're not doing what they used to do. B, they're uh, counting on your platform. And C, uh, everybody on the planet wants to be a famous author. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple stark realities. If any aspiring writers out there are listening and need, you know, some perspective, I am your cynical, jaded, bitter husk of a soul to tell you that, you know, publishing in the United States is not a meritocracy, okay? Um, you have got hard work and talent are great. Um, cultivate it, pursue it, be ambitious if you want, put in the work, get in the chair, but you have got to have luck. I'm sorry, you have got to have luck. I got lucky in France, a fantastic publisher who, by the way, would has talked told me on numerous occasions, don't worry about selling books. That's our job. You just write the books. All right. It's our job to sell the books. I mean, that's the complete inverse of what writers in the United States are facing. So, A, it's not a meritocracy. You can take any bestseller. Take Don Winslow's book, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's not Don, Don Winslow anymore. He's just nobody. But it, the, you don't change a word of text. Give it to five publishers, five different editors with five different publicists. You'll get five different results. And four out of those five will probably be what most writers experience. The book will disappear off the face of the earth, you know. So I hate to break it to folks, but that's just like, you know, the reality. And all you can do is have grit, determination, don't quit get your butt in the chair and move on to the next thing and don't get wrapped up in recognition and likes and retweets and why am I not famous yet? Or why don't I have a deal with Netflix? None of that matters. It's all bullshit. You know, just well, the only thing that matters is what's on the page and maybe you get lucky and folks discover it, but most likely they're not going to. So just quit. <laughs> <laughs> That part's a joke if my sarcasm isn't coming through. <laughs> Hang on one second. Honey, would you go get that rope? Yeah, just throw it over the garage yeah. truss. I'll be right out there after the show. You know, right. in, other, in other words, I, I just try and stay positive. You know? Yeah, I see that. 
<laughs> Honey, I've got a new church to go to. It's the Church of Peter Ferris. I think yeah, you're going to like of, it. I'm the God of negativity. Thank you. <laughs> Say hallelujah. Um, oh, my gosh. Okay. That is such a great jumping off point um, <clears throat> that I want to take a short break. And when we come back, I have a little something special. It's a new feature where I'm going to take one of my favorite scenes and provide an audiobook version of that scene in a new feature called If This Scene Could Talk. So stay with us. I'm here with Peter Ferris, and we'll be back right after this. Uh, there is nothing like the taste of fresh roast coffee. David Temple here for Writer's Block Coffee. And folks, this is my favorite. Deadline Dark is the one I've been drinking more of. As you can see, it's almost gone. This one is their uh, standard blend. And Whiskey Barrel Aged packs a little punch. No, there's no alcohol involved. I personally like whole bean. You know why? It's the freshest, and I grind it right then, so I'm drinking the very best brew I possibly can. If you'd like to enjoy fresh roast, direct-to-order coffee, go with Writer's Block Coffee. By the way, your first order, 15% off your first order. Just use the code, the Thriller Zone. How can you go wrong? If you watch the show or listen to the show, you know I'm always sipping on coffee, and this is, as they say, the real deal. Writer's Block Coffee. First order, 15% off. Try today. Hey, this is Peter Ferris, author of The Devil Himself, coming to you from my bunker in North Georgia. I am here with David Temple from The Thriller Zone. And now, back to the show. The book is The Devil Himself, and as promised, here is a little feature I'm calling If This Scene Could Talk. Leonard wiped his brow with a handkerchief and smiled. Since Maya's arrival, part of him had let go of that fixation on the past and his peculiar values and possessions and his hermetic way of life. The girl was reason for him to take stock, to consider a long overdue accounting of where he stood in the time stream of his life. Maya got out and walked along the side of the car. Is that a bullet hole? she said, pointing to, then fingering the perforation in the Studebaker's right front panel. Leonard nodded and passed a hand over the right rear well. That one there was a buckshot. Who shot at you? The, the cops? Marjane. She shot at you? Leonard shrugged. It's how we used to argue. What happened? <sighs> Long time ago, I used to drive the owner of a sawmill around town. Man's wife had taken a liking to this fella from Alabama that he played a pool hall 12 string guitar for nickels. Good looking scoundrel. Kid picked that damn thing, and women would pass that pool hall just to watch him. Marjean among them. But the sawmill boss didn't like his wife paying attention to a handsome young buck like that. So he gave me five dollars to run him out of town. I drove down to the pool hall, and there he was picking his guitar, and I admit it was quite a sight. All those women taken with him. Marjean right there with him. I walked over and said, Boy, I can pick that thing too. He handed over the guitar like he was daring me to, and I busted it over his head. <laughs> the women just shrieked. The boy ran off into the woods with the guitar hanging around his neck, and that's how Marjane come to pull her 32 wheel gun from her purse and shot at me, yelling, Leonard, you son of a bitch, we were just enjoying, and now he ain't got no guitar. Was she really that mad? Maya said. Mm, mad enough to drive off in my car. So I had to walk home, and the time I got back, she was sitting out on the front porch, and this time, she had my shotgun. She fired a warning shot and aimed low, but damn near blew off my big toe. To keep the peace, I had to promise to buy that kid a new guitar. Did you? With the five bucks, I got paid to wreck it in the first place, along with a soda pop, and because Marjean had me feeling guilty about the whole damn thing, a bottle of liquor besides. <laughs> Those were crazy times. They're still crazy. He hesitated, time traveling in his eyes and frozen expression. Her voice brought him back. Um, what's that? 
What color were your baby's eyes? Leonard looked off. Uh, well, I don't remember. I bet she was beautiful. He didn't answer, unable to meet Maya's gaze. So what makes babies go bad? She said, as if to change the subject. Why do they have to grow up and do terrible things to other people? I don't know. Suppose there's a tradition of evil. Gets carried on from generation to generation. Always been here, always will be. And then men that used you for money. They were all ugly, weren't they? Just seems I've never known a good person, Leonard. You're the first I ever known that wasn't that kind of ugly. Mm. I'm no saint. I've got my uglies too, all right. <laughs> got a beak on me that'd make a hawk jealous. And just the other day, I yanked a few gray hairs growing out of my ears. He laughed, but Maya's eyes had filled with emotion. She took a step toward Leonard. He wanted to move away, but whatever reserve he had been holding on to left him with a sigh. He held out an arm to Maya, and they embraced, and he told her that whatever happened to him, he wanted her to have what was his. That got her tearful, and she told him she loved him. Leonard held her tighter. Don't matter about me. I'm to take care of you, Maya. I don't understand. You don't have to. Not right now. He let her go then and told her to run on up to the house to help him fix supper. Maya smiled and wiped her eyes and began to skip childishly, deliriously toward the kitchen. When he glanced to the eastern sky above the tree line, Leonard saw a banded tree of titmice on the wing as he listened to the distress call that propelled them. Fantastic sound design, man. I love it. <laughs> yeah, I like me some good sound design. Dude, I know that was a long scene, and thank you for your patience for my listeners who went, how long is this thing going to go? But it's just one of those scenes that had a little bit of everything. And when you read the book, which you will, folks, <clears throat> you're going to see that there's so many complex layers. And you think you know what's happening at all times, and you do, but you don't know the whole story. And that's one of my favorite things, which we're going to get to here in a second. It's the layers and... um Man, uh, just, you know, all right, let's, so let's, that's from chapter nine of this book, The Devil Himself, Peter Ferris. And, you know, first of all, cool cover. I'm a big fanatic for cool cover, uh, engaging title, hell of a read. And I'm going to tell you a couple things why I liked it. Um, this book got to me early on, but I, I read a lot for this show, and I just happened to throw it into my bag when I flew out to see family this weekend. I just realized my southern accent's still here because of that uh, adaptation. Uh, so I read half the book on the way out and half the book on the way back. And that's always a great, you know, um, good thing for me. Uh, and also, I, and I hope this is a, it's, it's roundabout compliment. You know, it's under 300 pages. Generally, I'm reading books that are around that 3, 350, and I'm getting into some 4, 450s, but this is just sub 3. And it, to me, this is my new sweet spot. I love this book because it's, you know, you're, you're telling a great story. you got great characters. It's multi-layered, and, you know, you, you don't have to go on for 500 pages. So, Well, I, I to speak to that, I love... Same thing with screenwriting. If you can resolve a, a problem or accomplish something, I, I'm a huge fan of subtext, a huge fan of using precise, simple, lean sentences, concise writing, and pack as, into the dialogue, into the character's actions, pack as much subtext as possible and let that tell the story. Um, so I'm a big fan of, of lean writing and, and lean novels like that. And, you know, it does definitely is a cinematic type of book. I mean, it has changed a lot. I mean, I finished the first draft of that book in December 2012, I think, is the first dated complete first draft um, and thought it was going to come out within a, a year or two after Last Call for the Living. And it's just been able to go through some seasoning. Uh, it benefited from me, obviously, an ed editorial process in France and just kept working on it. My publisher at RK Publishing was incredible, and she just continued to help dial in those nuances, the granular detail of, I, I, I compare it to like uh, 
guy, uh, engineer who records music or masters music or is a mixer, you know, you're at the mixing board and all the, the music's there, all the tracks are there, that you just start adjusting levels. And that's what that book has benefited from over time anyway, is is getting um, scenes like that perfect, as perfect as I can get them. So. Well, a couple of thoughts. It reminds me of soup, you know, a really good soup, especially in the wintertime when you want that thing to stew for long, slow heat so that the, the different flavors marinate. Uh, the other thing is I was listening again to reference to Don Winslow. Yeah, I'm geeking out a little bit, fanboy. There you go. I said it um, last night at the uh, library gig. He was talking about, uh, yeah, you got to have talent. You got to have tenacity. La, 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 la. You got to have patience. And he went on this diatribe about patience. And referring back to uh, some earlier, more negative comments earlier, uh, <laughs> I, I, I would I would I would challenge listeners who are on the writing path to and, and you said it perfectly, Peter. Allow yourself the patience. Don't think that this don't think you're going to be one of these overnight successes. Uh, they're they're out there. I'm thinking of T.J. Newman and her book Falling, which came out uh, last summer uh, ish. And she was an overnight sensation. That thing went skyrocketing, uh, no pun intended. But uh, that is not the norm. That's the exception. So patience. Um, those two lead characters, Leonard and Maya, which we heard in the wonderful adaptation from the superstar actor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. There's... Well, you know, the, an audio book is in the work. I need to throw your name into that hat of potential narrators. Uh, fantastic. But a, a, anyway, to go back, Leonard and Maya, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no. And you know what? Side note, throw my hat in that ring because I would love I would love to do this. I mean, you know, that's what the booth behind me is for. I do audio books for some clients and voiceovers yeah. and so forth. But yeah, that would be fun. But I want to talk about Leonard and Maya because, damn, they're they're scarred and they're tragic, yet they're strong and they're resilient. And the way that you do that is not over the top cliche. And some of this is broken record. Some of this is just great insight, having spent now uh, 10 plus years writing stuff, trying to get to the point where I want to finally go out there and try to get an agent and so forth. But the characters are so, especially Leonard. Leonard was so much fun with that mannequin. I, I, the first couple of times, I'm like, what the hell is he doing with a mannequin? And then you realize there's so many other things going on. And then my, uh, uh, the prostitution and so forth. I was just, I was so hurting for her. But again, great, scarred, tragic, but strong, resilient. And then the bad guys, while not surprising or out of the ordinary, no offense, they were truly despicable and you know, there are bad people in good places, just like there's good people in bad places. And uh, politics has often been a mixed soup of the aforementioned uh, tragedy. So <laughs> I did the same thing in Last Call for the Living. I took a sort of sick delight. Readers would tell me, like, you had me rooting for one of the most despicable human beings I've ever read. It's like a, a member of like a, a white supremacist prison gang um, who a, a truly reprehensible person. But, you know, I think it's, it's uh, uh, a ch I look at it as a challenge. If you can take someone who, well, even Leonard is, is uh, clearly um, capable of going to that extra gear that a lot of criminal sociopaths go to. And that's show that happens early in, in the devil himself that, uh, despite all that the reader knows we're on we're on Leonard at team Maya and Leonard and um I I did fall in love with kind of that uh, pastoral bonding and the grant it's a grandfatherly relationship too it's not sexual at all right. um and that was that was something I was very uh, careful to consider as I've just worked through drafts and drafts and drafts yeah and you know what it's I'm glad you brought that up because if at one moment he had given in to some kind of a temptation in that genre that would have blown the whole story in my opinion you would have gone oh geez really so he's just another one of them yeah well you know I, i'd add to um that that they are the, they are that's they are what the novel is about um i'm playing in the crime fiction sandbox sure i have i'm hitting there's tropes and i'm hitting certain familiar notes with the corrupt mayor and cartels and drug running um Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. But that stuff is wallpaper. Like uh, the whole idea of the novel is um, to present like a crime fiction novel that's hopefully thrilling and entertaining. And maybe these things are familiar to crime fiction fans. But um, I, I just like the idea of taking very familiar notes and a song you think you've heard a million times and 
just doing something completely new with it. Because again, all that stuff is wallpaper. The, the story, the novel is about Leonard and Maya. It's about estrangement. It's about transformation. Maya is going through a huge character arc by the time we, we meet her at the end of the book. She's transformed drastically. Leonard obviously is a very, uh, after redemption at a certain point in the book without giving too much away. So um, yeah, I, I definitely had my sights set on those two. Yeah, and and I loved. Oh my gosh, I love the way her story arced, and uh, you know, it was it was the perfect balance, justification, if you will, and uh, it's everything you had hoped secretly that would happen, and it did, and it, it and you. So it also made me say, and Peter, don't take offense to this. It made me wonder if you could write, just for shits and giggles. If you could write something, uh, I'm not going to say romance, but I'm going to say like a heartwarming and not Hallmark, but a feel good story because you do, you pluck the strings of the heart throughout the story while you're gutting it with a knife. So, I mean, that. <laughs> I, uh, I could I could give you the sarcastic answer, which is no, somebody has to die. But no, there would be uh, I, I, I've never thought about um, what genre I'm playing. And this is probably to my detriment as a writer. My, you know, my father was known for right, principally horror and then psychological thrillers and suspense and supernatural um, uh, fiction Um and I gravitated to crime fiction pretty quickly, um, but I'm not opposed to just writing a novel that doesn't fit into any category if that's what comes out next. My next novel that's coming out in France uh, in, next year, excuse me, is um, my longest book to date and uh, utterly strange. I don't know how to, I, it might end my career in France. I think people are either gonna absolutely love it or they're gonna, they're gonna tear it apart. And I'm okay with that, but I, I don't feel like writing to, um, for a specific genre. I just like whatever comes out, comes out and then we'll let the chips fall. You know, I personally like that. Um, and, uh, and, uh, I'm going to throw in this one more reference to Don last night and then I promise I won't do it again, but he was, you know, uh, let me set it up this way. You can go to writers conferences and you can sit in front of guys who have gone before and they're going to tell you, you've got to be a pantser or a plotter. And most of them will tell you it's damn better to be a plotter because you know where you're going. But there's a lot of pantsing that goes on that really gives you pure joy and come to find out. And I've read pretty darn near every one of Don's books. I thought he was a plotter, pure pantser. Mm -hmm. As in flying by the seat of your pants, right? Flying um, by the seat of your pants, yeah. Yeah, and I've, I've never plotted a book yet either. Neither did my father, too. He, he sort of spoke of that same idea in different terms. You're either a bricklayer or an architect. Winslow's clearly an architect. I strive to be an architect where it, even a short book uh, just packed with subtext and um, the sort of the sort of layers you've referenced. I love books like that. I love fiction like that. Um, all my Mount Rushmore writers wrote that way too. Um, but you know, to each his own. There are people out there who have to absolutely plot and they kill it every single time. So you just have to figure out, you know, um, what kind of writer you want to be. It's as simple as that. That is exactly what he walked away saying. And and uh, Jeffrey Deaver, who I've admired from afar for decades and had the honor of speaking to recently, is a massive plotter. I mean, he is a 100-page-plus plotter. Now, the good news to that for those writing friends of uh, who are listening to the show, <clears throat> great thing is you know exactly where you're going. You got your beats. You got your arcs, you got your roadmap. It's all you got to do is get in the car, turn it on and go. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, I, uh, that's a great analogy for me. I just, it's just a, one, a series of practical questions, typically how my novels unfold. And they take a lot of time. Um, uh, both of my books started with endings and visuals and I had to figure out how to get there. It's like, I have this scene in a movie and it typically is the end. And I'm like, what is happening here with the devil himself? It was this girl in a field. Um, and I wanted to know who she was and how did she get there? And then you start asking these practical questions and all of a sudden this giant ball of yarn starts to unthread and you may have a novel there, or you may be driven to complete madness or alcoholism where you might jump off a bridge. I mean, I don't know, you know, this, the sky's the limit as far as <laughs> when you sit down to write a novel, anything can happen. So. <laughs> Holy shit, that's good. Okay, well, 
Here comes my biggest, uh, best compliment to you. And this is what you did, in, in my opinion. This is what you did best. You created place and atmosphere like few others. I mean, you nailed it. Which is why I took the extra little bit of time to do sound design on that audiobook version because I wanted to, in an instant where you had to get there really fast, I had to color the picture to the listener so they could kind of get an idea where they were, which is in a field and so forth, and a gravel, you know, dirt road and so forth. But boy, your sense of place and atmosphere. Well, I appreciate it, David. I mean, one of my favorite writers, a Mount Rushmore writer, is someone like Ron Rash, who describes Western North Carolina and Appalachia so well. Um, everything that I've written for, going forward from Last Call for the Living is sort of set where I grew up in sort of nor northern suburbs of Atlanta, North Georgia-ish. But everything I've written after is our they're based in places where I spend a lot of time, which is central Georgia, where I do hunt a lot and run around woods down there, and then in south Georgia. So um, all of that stuff is based on whether it's wildlife, um, landscape, uh, plant life, et cetera, is all just based on personal observations from just being out in the woods a lot. And um, I prefer it that way. Some writers can fake it and that's cool too. There's no right or way wrong to do it, right or wrong way. It's all about what details you choose and when you drop them in, you know? Well, uh, you you did it magnificently. And having grown up in the South, I mean, born and raised in North Carolina and spent many, many years in Virginia. And then uh, it, while in North Carolina, spent lots of time in Georgia because I drive down to audition for TV shows and movies. So I, I got to know Georgia pretty well. But here's what it is, is having grown up in the South, you, you just, you instantly and viscerally transported me back to childhood with the, with the sights and the sounds and the smells and the references. And, and here's what it is between you and writers like uh, Chris Swan, who was on the show, Mark Westmoreland, who was on the show, a new favorite, Scott Blackburn, who is a stinking big talent. You guys all make me want to go back into my past and pull up my stories growing up in Carolinas and Virginia and um, and just, you know. Yeah, I don't know if that's a Southern thing or not. Like you just, regional fiction, Southern regional fiction, sense of place has always been very prevalent. And uh, from sort of each generation of writer who wants to play in that sandbox, it, you, I, it, it sounds cliched, but yes, you do want the natural world to to be a character in your books. It certainly is in the devil himself. I mean, one of the big transformations for Maya too, by the end of the book, I don't want to give too much away is that she is a city girl comes from this, not only, you know, the, the, obviously the dark side of sex trafficking rings and partying and drugs and prostitution, but uh, an urban environment. And all of a sudden she's in serious raw land and a rural place that she's never experienced and uh at the beginning is really put off by it but by the end of the book hopefully readers will see she's starting to fall in love with it much like i think most people who turn to the woods for comfort um <laughs> like myself uh you know that pro that's that process of transformation is very much important in the, in the novel you know and having uh, grown up in the country and then uh bouncing from city to city doing a radio career it's funny, we were, uh, my wife and I were talking about this last night. We drove down to downtown San Diego to uh, do this gig last night. And then uh, as we're in amongst all the high rises and we met and lived in midtown Manhattan. So we know what a city's like, but we found ourselves as we were pulling out, heading back to the suburbs uh, uh, north of San Diego. We're like, man, yeah, that big city's fun, but I like the simplicity of just, you know, quieter and simpler and yeah i'm much I'm, I'm an absolute misanthrope and i love solitude so i mean i'm comfortable being around folks but i would much i can go i could go weeks or months without talking to somebody i could care less <laughs> i mean <laughs> i won't do that because i care about my friends but as far as like a writer i've for crime fiction in particular i've always i've never been drawn to asphalt like i've been drawn to kudzu and i just continue to be drawn to kudzu uh and don't care much about asphalt plenty of guys are doing the asphalt thing and that's totally cool and that, that you know it depends on maybe your, where you grow up uh what your you know sensibilities are but that's that's always been kind of my direction as far as where my writing's gone yeah well, I like the earlier comment you made too, is, you know, you just figure out where you fit and uh, plug yourself in. Let's go back to Leonard and uh, uh, Maya for just a second. So Leonard Moya is, uh, I'm curious, who from your past 
did you loosely base him upon or did you? Um, he was loosely inspired by somebody on my, uh, I heard about um, from my wife's side of the family. Um, her grandparents in particular knew a fella down in South Georgia who um, had a reputation for kind of having a little bit of outlaw ways for a little time, but he, he also lived like a straight life as far as I understand. Um, but kind of as a lark at one point, he drove around town where they're from with a mannequin in the passenger seat. Um, kind of like, I think this goes back to the seventies. So almost like trolling before it was trolling. I think the guy kind of just got a kick of, uh, out of spooking, you know, the, the townspeople are like, what is he doing? That's so weird, but it wasn't a regular or consistent thing. I absolutely love that story. And, uh, my wife and I have been together a long time. I got, you know, very close with her family, especially her, on her grandparents, got to hear a lot of cool stories about life in South Georgia back then. And I just took that Speaking of imagery, I had a girl in a field and I had this guy riding around with a mannequin in the passenger seat. And I wanted to know, what if this guy lives with the mannequin? What if that mannequin is filling uh, some sort of hole in his life? And um, this, again, going back to to start asking practical questions and building this character, it started right there. That was the seed. Of, and, you know, that goes back, we're going back 10, 12, 15 years where I first heard about this guy. And sort of turned it into this novel, basically. Wow. Yeah, um, man, I, I, I'm going to say this again, too. The, the sign of a gifted writer, <clears throat> and there's the difference between good and okay and gifted, and you fall into gifted, in my opinion. Wow, is, thanks, man is that I finished that book on Sunday and I can't tell you just how many times I have revisited those characters in my mind and almost to the point of, I wonder, I wonder what they'd be up to today if the story continued, you know, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but well, um, I do my favorite novels. I, I say this without comment to myself. I do hope readers reactions are that it's not disposable, that, it's a lean book, sure, but uh, that it's not disposable, that the characters and story elements linger. Maybe they want to revisit it one day. All my favorite writers, I turn to their books again and again uh, with, with some separation, you know, and that's a lot of fun. Um, all, nothing against commercial thriller and mystery writers. You know, that, that, that stuff has a place, but I'm hoping that the book has, has some timelessness to it. I, I aspire to that. I mean, chances are it will disappear, <laughs> but you know, I, I take that as a super high compliment, David. Thank you. Well, um, you're welcome. Uh, uh, sentence number one on chapter one, the girl in the trunk had been bound. Okay. <laughs> Go to any writing class anywhere in America. And they're going to tell you folks, you got to grab me by the first sentence or you're not going to keep me. And that one did it. Well, thanks. I think that was me just ripping off Donald Westlake or something. <laughs> but that first line has not changed in the, yeah, shit. 2012 was the first draft. So uh, again, it just a first draft, but this, it wasn't, that novel was intact. It's, it's gotten better and better over time, but yeah, that first sentence has not changed. It has always started right there in the trunk. So good. Yeah. All right, before we get to rapid fire questions, which I know you know a little bit about, I want to ask a question that I ask all of my guests. And that is, if you had to, and we're it's it's a simple one, just boil it down to, I mean, you've kind of referenced it earlier. If you had that single best piece of advice that you'd give people considering a writing career, and it could be it could be advice that has been given to you that you go, yeah, you know what, that I live by that. Or it could be your own that you developed over time. What would that be? Uh, quit quit. We don't need any more writers. We don't need any more writers. There are enough of us. Please quit. Go learn to weld. Go learn to fit pipe. Just quit. No, <laughs> I'm totally kidding. I'm totally kidding. Um, so, uh, yeah, so here's the thing, you know, to go back to, you, you, if you hang out and pay attention to the publishing business in this country, and I grew up with a novelist for a father, is that again, it's not a meritocracy. You can do everything right. You can have talent, you can write a great book and you still, if you don't have any luck, will not make it. The adverse is you can write a semi-coherent novel, find an agent who thinks they can make a buck off of you. Oh, here comes my cat, by the way. And okay. that book will be, you know, 
be with the right circ under the right circumstances, launch the bestseller list and explode and you win the lottery because it is a lottery, you know, any creative pursuit really is this applies in music, filmmaking, sculpture, painting, you name it, like, you know, it's a huge risk. So I would advise everyone who wants to write fiction is um, certainly have a plan and a fallback, do it because you love it. Uh, always remember that most writers don't get the career they think they deserve. Okay. It's just, you, you have this, you, 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 it's just, you have to be prepared for failure. And that's just a fact of life. You can go, you can do everything right and go your entire life and die with manuscripts on your hard drive that nobody ever sees. And that's just life. You're just, you know, maybe I'm publishing in the wrong decade. A lot of us are, I think, you know, if I was publishing in the seventies, you know, I maybe be thriving right now, but it's just not the case. So you have to accept all of these huge, awful sort of re stark realities and just try not to get wrapped up in recognition and success and ego and the things that are ancillary to just putting words on the page and trying to be a good storyteller. Um, and it's hard. That takes mental discipline. You know, that's why writers drink and despair and depressed and are, you know, and are, you know, soulless, empty, like sad little creatures because you know, you want to, you want to succeed. You want recognition. You want your work to be read. You want it to be turned into a movie or a TV show so you can make some money and brag about it on Twitter or whatever. I don't know. It's like, <laughs> it, you, you gotta, and I say this because I've been wrapped up in that and I know that how unhealthy it is. So I would advise writers to do everything right as far as learning your craft, but try to have some perspective because you're pursuing a, something creative and luck has so much to do with it that um, you have got to accept that it just might not work out. Yeah. You know? Don't stop, <laughs> but it just might not work out. <laughs> well, that is good advice. And um, I do want to ask this one question. You made me think about this and uh, I'm assuming, is your father still alive? Yeah, yeah, he is. He's retired. Okay. okay. I, I apologize for not knowing that. Did he, was he a big proponent of saying, son, come on, Peter, get in there and do it. Was he an encourager for you to uh, follow this passion or did he go, or was he bitter and bent and uh, disgruntled like you and said, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, he um, uh, has always been really supportive. When I got serious about fiction writing after I uh, fortunate enough to go to college after college, I was working a day job and playing in a band and music was a big part of my life playing music that would never, ever have a chance of being appreciated on a wide scale, like harsh, extreme, heavy music. But, you know, we made a go of it, we toured, recorded. Um, and then I got serious about fiction writing uh, because I was really into writing lyrics. And he was absolutely ruthless with his red pen when he looked at early samples. And if you saw that stuff, to quote the great Larry Brown, you'd have to say I had no talent. What I wrote was garbage. And he was ruthless in that respect, but he never told me like, give up, like you don't have what it takes. Like you have got most writers, some walk, some, you know, are, are advanced and just have a knack for it right away. Most of us though, you really have to cultivate it. You have got to write crap to get to the good stuff. So I went through that sort of apprenticeship period and my dad always was supportive and he, he hasn't stopped and he feels for me with, you know, he's knows I, he knows I've been frustrated in another timeline, the devil himself comes out in 2015 and is made into a feature film or is a show on Netflix in season three. And all my other books come out on a major publisher. And I'm like, you know, really realizing my dream, but didn't work out that way. That's cool. You know, and he's never, never criticized that. And he's just, he's always been there for me in that respect. And I'm sure he's proud of you now. Time for a little rapid fire questions. And they are not all completely original this time around. Doesn't matter. They're still good. All right. Time for rapid fire questions. All right. You found yourself stuck in a precarious situation with Leonard on his property. When suddenly you find a gaggle of bad guys heading your way. Now, Leonard has the only gun to defend himself, Peter. Sorry to say. And you have a choice. He tells you to run out to the barn and pick one of three things to defend yourself. There's three things out there. You get a choice between a shovel, a garden hose, or a jar of homemade moonshine. Now, which one are you going to pick and why? Um, I would pick the moonshine, uh, drink it all in one gulp, and then die <laughs> on the ground. <laughs> You're such an optimist. <laughs> Try and stay positive, David. That's all. There you go. All right. 
On a slightly different note, you and your family have taken a vacation to a remote exotic island. Again, good news. Bad news coming, though. Your cruise ship has run out of fuel and won't be back for a good long stretch. We don't know how long. Could be a long time. What are the top three things you are so glad you thought ahead of to pack, not including your cell phone? Oh, God almighty. A good book, hopefully. Or maybe if you have a tablet, you've got plenty of books. Um, certainly something that can play music or, or else I'd go insane without those two things in my life. And then the third thing would probably would probably be uh, ample supply of goldfish for my six-year-old son. Because um, I know he can sustain himself off of goldfish for an extended period of time. So, yeah, if I had like a, a Costco-sized 35-pound sack of goldfish, those three things, I'd be, I'd be perfect. You know, so. <laughs> oh, God, superb. <laughs> All right. Number three, you and your wife are invited to a dinner party with my wife, Tammy, here in San Diego to celebrate the global success of your monster book. Thing is, we want you to bring two more guests with you just to round out the cocktail hour here out on the veranda. There are two people that we're going to have you invite. Um, maybe they're, you've always wanted to meet them. They can be living or dead. Of course, when they show up to the party, they'll be living. Who are they and why? Ooh, that's a tough one. I mean, I I want to draw from writing, filmmaking, and or music, but I'm just going to jump to filmmaking. Uh, I'd want to have Sam Peckinpah and Chris Christopherson there. <laughs> Will there be alcohol served at this little? Oh spot? yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Plenty. <laughs> Plenty. And why did you pick those two? Uh, I just uh, always a I'm a huge fan of Sam Peckinpah's uh, films. Um, I love Chris Christopherson's music and his heyday as a movie star in the 1970s. Uh, Pat, uh, Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid is one of my favorite movies of all time. I just thought that would make for lively conversation. I mean, Peckinpah might pull out a bunch of cocaine or something. Things might get kind of sideways. But you know. <laughs> All right. And number four, last one, since I'm also a filmmaker. I'm always seeking books as either movies or I'm seeing them as uh, movies or TV shows. Uh, so Hollywood has just bought the devil himself and wants you, Peter, to help choose the characters to ba play both Leonard and Maya. Who would you pick? Real quick, I'd say Maya would be it'd be perfect to have an unknown actress. So I'm not going to name anyone there because I think it would be a perfect star making vehicle for an actress who's, you know, uh, just starting out. Um, Leonard. Oh, uh he, he sadly passed away, but I always was thinking of Powers Booth in my head. Um, uh, and then a secondary actor would be Kurt Russell. Um, there's quite a few from that generation of actors, but Powers Booth and Kurt Russell would be, you know, like my, my dream film, you know. Uh, Leonard, I think, would be a really juicy role for an actor in that age group. Um, yeah. and, there, and there's so many talented ones. Yeah, the sky's the limit there. But yeah, when I was writing it, I just kept thinking of Powers Booth, who I adored. And that so many films going back to the, the 80s, uh, was when I grew up watching movies. And I've always loved Kurt Russell. So those two guys are big on my list. Awesome. Well, folks, if you'd like to learn more, visit PeterFerris.com or follow him on Twitter like I do at author PJ Ferris. Peter, this has been so good. I had a feeling it was going to be good. I, I, you're the kind of guy that I, I, I could turn this into a two or three hour show. I have a feeling. Man, best of, best wishes on the future of the Thriller Zone from starting from scratch to what you have now. The guests you've had are fantastic. And I love, too, that you're giving voice to writers across the spectrum. You've had Ace Atkins and huge bestsellers on your show. And then you're giving voice to guys just starting out. Um uh, and that's important because it's so hard. We're all, it's such a fire hose of content. We're all screaming, flapping our arms, you know, look at me, look at me, look at me. And any outlet like this is just invaluable for us, you know? Well, I, I really appreciate those nice words. And I'll tell you, it's, you know, it, it, to the same tune of what you were saying about writers, I've always loved radio since I was a kid. I've always loved podcasting. I didn't do it uh, early on because I thought, geez, everybody's doing it. And then I waited about 10 15 years and now I'm doing it and it's grown really super fast and I hope it's because of the experience but you know there's such a competition for listenership that I'm you know I'm my wife is always laughing at me she's like I'm like honey it's not growing fast enough it's not growing fast enough she's like look it was it was June last year and you had four listeners mm -hmm. and uh, look at look who's on your show now what a fun time yeah, thanks, David. This has been a blast. I hope one day I can uh, visit again and talk about another book and 
tell riders to quit. <laughs> we don't need any more. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. That was a lot of fun. Learned a lot. <laughs> Little morsels to take along with us for the rest of the day. The Devil Himself, Peter Ferris's book. Grab a copy. You'll like it. Now, coming up on next week's show, I am probably one of the biggest Jason Bourne fans out there. I'm telling you, the Matt Damon television or movie series, I have watched again and again and again and again and again. I can't, you know, it's one of those, that's when you know you have a hit on your hands. Like it's a Saturday or Sunday afternoon. You're not really sure what to watch. I'll always go to Jason Bourne. Well, from the creators of Jason Bourne comes the Treadstone Transgression. And my guest will be Joshua Hood. I, I just started this. It's one of the fastest moving books I think I've read in a while. Um, I may say that a lot, but uh, it's still the truth. Okay, so huge, huge Mark Grain. He says, an intense and electrifying espionage adventure, a worthy addition to the Ludlam bookshelf. Book list, loves it. Uh, Jack Carr says, Joshua Hood crushes it, proving himself a worthy inheritor of the legacy. Real Book Spy loves it. Florida Times Union, everybody loves it. You're going to love it too. So join me when Joshua Hood joins the Thriller Zone on the next show. Until then, I want to say thank you to my new sponsors, Writer's Block Coffee, who is offering a coupon code for the Thriller Zone, 15% off your first order, and also to thank you to AuthorBytes.com, who's giving you three months free with a one-year contract. Without guys like this, this show would be uh, tougher and tougher to manage, but uh, thank you so much. Folks, make it a great time, and I'll see you next time on The Thriller Zone. <laughs>